The title for the sermon this morning is Farewell Discourse Part 4. Jesus is either hated or loved. There's no middle ground. And you might be wondering how many farewell discourses there are. I could make many more, but I wanted to make them all one sermon. It's just a really long sermon for you guys. Right? It would it, be beautiful to be able to do it all at once, but it would take me approximately six hours so we're chopping it into pieces, right? So let, let's try to remember how this is all connected, right? If we look to last week, what did we get? I am the vine, you are the branches. He talks about abiding, remaining, staying in his word, in him, and that if we have any produce, any fruit bearing, it is because the branch has remained or abided or stayed in the vine, Jesus is the vine, the Father is the vine dresser, and we are the branches within that vine. And so the major takeaways that we could get from that is because he is going to be the one that is necessary for us to be able to produce fruit, the fruit that he wants us to produce is going to be a love for one another. The Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Son loves us, and the Father loves us, and we the same in turn love them. We are to abide in that love. We are to abide in that word. We are to abide in Christ, stay with him. Now, all these things he wrote so that we will follow the command. It is a command-driven uh, reality. Yes, can we follow those commands by faith in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Is there maybe the potential of us being legalistic in the application of that? Sure. Uh, the, the, the human uh, person does that. But its driving force as we follow those commands, what? By faith is those who have been redeemed in Christ Jesus. Now, we get to verse 18, and we go from abiding in love and remaining in Christ, and, and this loving one another and loving one another and loving one another. There's about five separate times that that's repeated, right? So even though it kind of starts out with the harsh reality that, hey, you might get cut out if you don't remain and stay, it finishes with the beautiful, Let, let's love one another, right? That, that is a good admonition to receive. You know, I can walk away feeling okay about that. Then you get to verse 18, and it seems like the polar opposite of that. Now we're going to talk about hate. How many of you want to talk about hate today? Not me. Not really into it. However, it is a blazingly clear passage that helps us to understand who Christ is and a disciple's relationship, not to Christ, but to the world. We get to understand Christ's relationship to the world, and we get to understand a disciple's relationship to the world. So let's define disciple real quick. Who's a disciple of Christ? Those who are followers of Christ. Those who have repented and believed for the forgiveness of their sin. Those who have received Christ as their Savior. Those are disciples. Those are learners of Christ. The word disciple means a learner of Christ or a follower of Christ. So are you a disciple of Christ? Are you a follower of Christ? Okay, well then this is for you. I think sometimes we come to a passage like this and there's like the, the suspending of an acceptance that this might be talking about me. Especially because we're going to come across this and we're going to be like, yeah, that seems kind of like a weird pity party kind of thing. Oh, the world hates me, right? We all know people that think that everybody hates them and you know, it, it's just kind of maybe an attention getting thing. This is not that. This is not the, oh, everybody dislikes me, I might as well go eat worms, right? This is a harsh statement. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you, right? So Jesus is markedly hated by the world here. We see it by the rejection of Jesus. Jesus is rejected by religious people, Jesus is rejected by the irreligious people. Jesus is rejected by anybody that cuts across their lane of what they think needs to be done. The world hates Jesus. And there's no middle ground for that either. You've, know, you've all known people that you, like everybody loves them or hates them. This is Jesus. There's no ambiguity here. Even the people that proclaim to be some manner of indifferent, yeah, Jesus never thought of them. 
No, no. If you're not abiding in Christ, there is a particular hatred for Christ, even if you have not fully been confronted by Him. It's an either or. You're either loving Jesus or you're hating Jesus. And here's the kicker. The very hatred of Jesus is matched by Jesus' love. If you were of the world, let's just stop right there. If you were of the cosmos, let's take a step like back a bunch of chapters to chapter 3. And we all know this one, right? It's the end zone verse, as I like to call it. For God so loved the world, for God so loved the cosmos, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That is what we think is a quintessential gospel message. And guess who hates the one who came and died for them? The world. It's the same word. It's the same exact word. Not just in English, in the Greek as well. The world that Jesus died for is the world that hates Him. They hate Him, and we can't turn Him into everybody's favorite Uncle Si. Right? We have an Uncle Si in the room somewhere. Hi, buddy. Everybody's favorite Uncle Si, right, is from the Duck Dynasty. Everybody, you know, he's one of those endearing characters. Mildly annoying, but man, you love him, right? He might tell you what to do every once in a while, but you know what? He's a riot to have at the family picnics. That's not Jesus, man. He's not the lovable uncle, or he's not the, the ever-so-loving, kind and wise guru, because everybody kind of likes that. Right, the guy that always has the right answer for the situation. I, I kind of feel like our chosen movie video things that we watch, whatever the, the mini series thing, I forget what it's called. It's chosen, right? I think that's what they kind of present him as. He's always got the right answer. He's always the guy that when you're mechanicing on the truck, is like, well, have you thought of doing this? And you do it, and you're like, oh, it's amazing. Somehow that's Jesus. Here's the thing. The world hates Jesus. We cannot, as evangelicals, turn him into somebody that is going to be acceptable to everybody. If we make him acceptable to everybody, then we lose something of who he is. The very nature of Jesus and the gospel proclamation and presentation makes him disliked. Why? Because there's judgment in the gospel. There's judgment in the gospel. Where, where does the judgment come? It's because it's the finger pointing saying, you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You can't save yourself. That's, that's a judgment. That is a judgment saying you need something and you don't have it. And you can't do it. And what do we like to do? Ha! Huh, watch me. I'll do it. And how well does that go for us? Not very well. And so when we then have the, the divine creator, sustainer, and upholder saying, you know, nope, you can't do it. We get offended by him. And so what do we do? Well, I'll tell you what we do as preachers. We think about ourselves. Because I don't like being disliked as a preacher. And I don't like people not showing up. And so I want to measure my metrics of success and obedience based off of, you know, budgets and baptisms and buildings and all that kind of stuff. How many pews are filled and when they're not filled, I, I have to go, oh, maybe I'm doing it wrong. Because those things begin to not add up, right? And so what do we change? I've got to make a more palatable Jesus. Well, you've hung around me long enough. I'm not into it. Not only am I not into it, I'm going to gauge my metrics of success differently. How about I present Jesus like Jesus presented himself? How about we who are disciples of Christ, who are called to the ministry and service of Christ, present Him like He would want to be presented, as He says He is. Now that takes effort, my friends. That takes lots of effort to come in and study and find out who He is and then recognize that there's going to be some corrections in who I assume He might be. Because I have a predisposed disposition to the Uncle Si kind of Jesus. I do. And there are others that have different versions of Jesus that they have a predisposition, predisposition toward in which the Scripture comes in and corrects it. One of the things that I think is a predisposed Jesus, however you want to label him, is the Jesus that everybody likes. And if I present him winsomely enough, 
oh, buddy, we're just going to have revival. The fact is, is that if the world hates us, it's because they hated him first. And if you were of the world, the world would love you. If you were of the world, the world would love you. That's what I find so ironic is the church is trying to get, garner the love of the world so much they don't realize that phrase right there says basically if you're friends with the world, you're at enmity with God. James actually says that specifically and explicitly. If I am friends with the world, I am an enemy of God. What does friendship with the world mean? Friendship with the world is doing things the world's way. Not God's way. And first and foremost, having the consideration to what does the world want? What would people on the outside think? What would people in my, whatever, my, my professional sector think rather than what would God think? What would Jesus think? I think all too often we are more concerned about what the world thinks and what we think rather than what God thinks. But if we were following Christ, if we are following Christ, the world's not going to love us. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. The world hates genuine Christianity. Let that seek in. Do not be surprised. Do not be surprised that we are not above our master in that. We are not going to receive the world's re approval. Remember, verse 20, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep my word, they will also keep yours. Now, stop and spend some time there. A servant is not above his master. If Jesus received, well rejection almost in an absolute sense if they persecuted him what are they going to do to us right there is going to be various levels and times of persecution and there have been throughout the church and the history of the church and there are currently in our world these things going on if we were to stop digesting and ingesting what they're selling us through news media outlets today, which, you know, majors on selling fear, we would know that the church across the world is suffering because of the world, because of the rejection of Christ. That Jesus is not accepted, or the church is not accepted everywhere on earth like it is accepted in America I find it interesting that we are shocked at the direction of our world before us when I want to stand in the background going, I'm not surprised! Here it comes! It said it's coming, and yet we've almost hidden our head, hit our head in the sand. The fact is, is, our metrics for why we do what we do should be based on God's Word and not the acceptance of the world. And when the world doesn't accept us, okay, we're in good company. We're in good company. A servant is not greater than his master. And if they persecuted me, Jesus speaking, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Ask yourself this question, how well did they keep his word? Like just on a scale of 1 to 10 for the three years of his public ministry, how well did the people that he was preaching to keep his word? How many of them kept his word? Well, I don't want to say it's none. It was some, right? And as time went, there were more. But as the word spread to more and more, it seems like fewer people listen to God's word than not. And so the same thing is going to be applied. Do not be surprised. Do not be surprised that even though Jesus, one who was anointed by the Holy Spirit, that was God fully God and man fully man, and when he spoke, people marveled. They marveled that he spoke with authority, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. 
And as they marveled at that, how many of them kept listening? Not many. How many abandoned him and walked away? I'm telling you, I would have loved to have been there for the Sermon on the Mount when he sat in the boat and everybody was sitting there in the acoustics of the water. That would have just been, that would have been a sermon, right? That, you know, Doc and I had been like, yeah, we were at the Sermon on the Mount, <sighs> right? And yet, how many people that heard the Sermon on the Mount remained unrepentant? I would say Jesus is probably the best preacher that there ever was or is, and yet many people failed to listen. If they don't listen to his words, are they going to listen to ours? But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. What has been a repeated theme? They don't know the Father. They don't know the Father. Here's one thing that is exceedingly common in our culture. We like to talk about God, generally speaking. We like to talk God in spiritual manners. And in many times, we talk about a God in such a way where Mormons can stand right next to us and you can't tell the difference. And is there a difference? Absolutely. Sorry, it's distracting me. Stand back. There's an absolute 100% difference between Mormons and genuine Christians. Those who really believe what the Bible has to say. And if I'm just generally talking about God as this general entity in which I have vague affection towards, I'm missing it. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And by believing in Him, we have what? Forgiveness of sins. By believing what He did. The God-man. The second member of the Trinity. The one that has pleased the Father is sitting here saying they don't know God. They don't know who God is. And I feel like that in many ways. We have a culture that claims to know something about God, generally speaking, and they don't know God the Father. They don't know the Creator. We might be created by Him, but His creaturely beings reject Him. They know Him not. And when they are confronted with the one true living and holy God, when they are confronted with the Christ, what do they do? Uh, Ryan, do you really have to make that big of a deal of doctrine? That's what they do. Do you really have to mince the words like this? Could you be nicer? Man, I've been trying to be nice for 44 years. I've been praying for it. I've been repenting of it. I ask for forgiveness for it constantly. I really do. I want to be a gentle person. But you know what? It doesn't matter whether I'm gentle or not. It doesn't matter whether I'm nice or not. It doesn't matter whether I yell and scream. And it doesn't matter whether I sit up here and talk with a sissy's voice. And if you have this voice, I'm sorry. You're a sissy. <laughs> sorry. The fact is, is that the Spirit of truth, when He speaks, brings people to life. And He changes them. And He actually cares about the truth. He cares about what's there. Jesus cares about how He is presented and how He is displayed. And on account of Jesus, they're going to do all kinds of things to His people. And He says, if I had not come, and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my Father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my Father. That is a really hard one to unpack, and we could spend a really long time on it. But essentially, the gospel is a judgment. And when people hear the gospel, then they are without excuse. And that's a hard one, right? Because then why go do foreign missions? Why go tell people about this? Wouldn't it be better if I just left you in ignorance? No. No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Yeah, they're, they're guilty because they've heard and rejected. They, they have a particular guilt of unbelief that they are walking within. 
that when they see Jesus, they go, eh, I don't think so. And they either create some variation of Jesus or they absolutely walk away and say something else. But the fact is, is the gospel, when proclaimed, becomes something that bears judgment upon a person because they either have to accept or reject it. They either have to say, I love it or I hate it. And what do a lot of people do? They respond negatively. That's a hard one. This is a hard one for me. When I first read this years ago, the very first thing that came to my mind is, why do missions? Why tell anybody about Jesus? What I'm going to do is, I had a plan. I'm not even joking about this. I'm only going to tell people about Jesus when they come and talk to me about Jesus. How well did that work? It didn't. Nobody wanted to talk to me about Jesus ever. Nobody ever walked up to me and was like, hey man, you look like a nice guy. Do you, do you possibly have the ability to tell me about Jesus? That's never happened. Not in a million years. And if it did happen, I might fall over. I've had one person try to witness to me in the 20 plus years, 25 years or whatever it's been that I've been a Christian. And as they were doing it, I was like, oh, this is awesome. And they're like, what? I'm like, no, no, keep going. You're doing good, buddy. And they're like, huh? I'm like, no, just, I want to hear you get to it. Tell me about Jesus. And he's like, you're already a Christian, aren't you? I'm like, yeah, but just keep going. And he stopped because the fact, yeah, I was, I was upset. I cried a little bit. The fact is, is that you're not going to have a lot of those conversations unless you're going and saying it. Unless you're going and pressing the issue. Unless you're saying, hey, look, man, I know this sounds like an Amway sales pitch not here's light and life and, and here's hope and i feel like you're hurting right now and i want to share with you the beauty of christ and what he's given me and if they reject it man that stinks that is judgment on them but if they accept it it is beautiful these words were written in the law and they must be fulfilled that he hated me, that they hated me without cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. So what is the Holy Spirit for? What is the Helper for in this? Is the helper for you to you know, have some sort of ecstatic emotional event when the preacher gets excited and the songs are really good and you walk out, ah, this church is amazing today, right? Is that what the Holy Spirit's for? I'm glad a bunch of people are like, no. and Never skip like that again, please. The fact is, the Holy Spirit is the helper that helps us to bear witness about Christ. The Holy Spirit is a stamp and a seal of God's owning you. You are His property. You are a people or a person of His own possession. And as that stamp and seal of His approval and His redeeming of you exists, that helper is not just to help you in some sort of, as some sort of like emotional coping mechanism. But that helper helps you to bear witness about Christ in you. That helper helps you to be able to proclaim Christ when and where necessary. And one of the primary functions of us being left behind or remaining here until Jesus returns is to bear witness about Christ. To bear witness about Christ in times like we are having. Because I'm about to confess something. I'm not a terribly positive person all of the time, and I'm really working on it. I always have been. However, I don't think things are going to wax better and better. I think they're going to go worse and worse. I don't think we're going to stop having these things because a couple years back, I asked for things to stop. All right, Lord, I need a break. Can I come up for air just for a few minutes? And he was like, oh, no. <sighs> all right. You know, you get into it. You, you trust him in the middle of it. And one after another, right? And I know many of us feel like that in life. One thing after another is going to come bearing down upon us. And in the middle of all of these things, we are filling up what is lacking in the suffering and affliction of Christ for the sake of his name. And we are making much of him and we are bearing witness to the sufficiency of Christ in us. We are bearing witness to the fact that he is more satisfying than anything the world has to offer. 
We are bearing witness to the fact that our hope is found in Him. And though we grieve, and though we mourn, and though we suffer, and though we have pain, we rejoice in who Christ is and what He has done, that He, for the joy set before Him, went to the cross, running that race, shaking off the things that encumbered Him, seeking to please the Father. For the joy set before Him, He suffered and bled and died. That we might know Him. Praise God, He did that for us. And we bear witness to that. We bear witness to what Christ has done for us and what He has given to us in Himself. It is not this treasure and this trinket to be held only to me. It is not something that I get a hold of and I get to walk around and, and have the, this singular soul possession where I never tell anybody about it or display any of it. I've been given this thing. You've been given this thing in Jesus Christ. And by faith in Him, we are called to bear witness. And He's actually given us help to bear witness to the beautiful reality of the gospel. But pastor, I don't know how to share it. Sure you do. Sure you do. Hey, this is my Savior Jesus. I would like to introduce him to you. Right? He died on the cross for my sin and for your sin. Um, you got any questions? There you go. It's a great start, right? Or you could share him by simply rejoicing in his goodness. Praising his holy name for certain things through your day. Telling people why you have hope and why you do not mourn in a hopeless state. Because all of us have that, do we not? I started out today like I started out in the pastoral prayer because we are a grieving people. We are a mourning people. If it's not cancer that's taking us, it's, it, it's suicide. If it's not suicide that's taking us, it, it's other things. We live in a hurting place. And I'm not comparing us to anywhere else. I'm just comparing us to ourselves. There's pain right now. There's mourning, suffering, loss, and difficulty right now. Where is our hope found? Where is my hope placed? Let us bear witness to that. We have the Holy Spirit of God to help us bear witness to that. To be ever thankful for what He has done and who He is. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. He tells us why he's writing these things. He says two times, and he wants us to be prepared for it. I can tell you, if you tell me that I need to go do something, and you tell me exactly what the parameters of that something are, I, I probably could go do it. If you're like, Brian, go run, you know, 14 miles. I would hate you, but I would go do it. I have actually had that experience. My buddy drives up one day, he comes in, he goes, hey, let's go run around Lake Glendale. And I was like, <laughs> no. And he's like, no, serious. And I'm like, like, run the whole time? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, on gravel road? He's like, yeah. And I was like, you won't do it. You'll quit. And he goes, no, I won't. So we ran 14 miles, and I wasn't running at all at that time. It's terrible, but we did it. I knew my end point. We parked to a truck. We knew where everything went. We drove around at once. We went and we did, right? It's possible. This is what he's telling us. He said, hey, the marathon's coming. He told them specifically the way that it's going to be coming for them, and he gives more clarity to them for how it's going to be coming. But the reality is, is these things are also written for the sake of us who came later than them to tell us that difficulty is coming. Difficulty is coming, my friend. It's not a matter of if, it's just when. And I wish the idealism of my youth still remained and things would just get better and better, but they're not. I'm convinced one of these days I'm just going to be walking and my arm's just going to fall off. And I hope to be to the place with Christ that I'm just like, well, it's a flesh wound. And just roll on with it. To be able to handle whatever affliction or difficulty or pain or suffering comes my way. Whatever is there. Whatever rejection might happen. 
whatever persecution might come, that I might be found faithful in him and not give up. He tells us, that he writes us, to keep us from falling away. Because what happens to the Christian where they come to faith in Christ, they get so excited, difficulty comes in, what do they do? They wilt away under the pressure. He's writing these things so that we don't. So that we might be prepared to go on that long run and not stop, just keep slogging away. That's one thing that, by God's grace, I hope he carries me through that I finish well, that I just keep running. All it is is one more step. It's never longer than that. It's one more step. One more step. One more step filled with faith. One more step filled with dependence upon him. One more step resting in his goodness. I don't have to worry about the step after that. I don't. His word is a lamp and a light to my feet and my path, and I can always see right here by his good grace to take one more step and trust in him. And so Christians, I pray that's what we do. I pray that as we see the world hates Christ, inevitably there's going to be a hatred towards us. And that's okay. You're not doing anything wrong. I mean, unless you're just kind of a jerk and like, you know, going around punching people in the face, then maybe you should stop doing that and like have them actually hate you for the right reason. But accept it, embrace it, rejoice that Christ has made us his own, and then rejoice in who we are together. I know this is going to be sermons to come, but I want to do encourage us in this. There's something placed within us as humans to need one another. I need you and you need me. I cannot be a man on an island. Neither can you. And as we need one another, we are able to hold together in Christ One of the things that we're going to be doing next week that I want you to, by God's grace, prepare your heart for on Saturday night and and even through the week is we're going to come and we're going to take and partake together in the Lord's table. And as we do that with one another, there is a unifying reality going on. We are participating one with another in that time. And as we participate with one another, we're participating in what Christ has done for us and what Christ has given to us, what He has earned on our behalf. We are standing together in the unity of that and by God's grace. When I look around and I see another person put the bread in their mouth and have the cup pass over their lips, that is me doing it with you, is sharing and participating in the same reality, being held together in Christ, saying their hope is found in the same place my hope is found in, and we're walking in that together. And the unifying reality of that is also a strengthening reality. There's an excitement when I see other people doing that same thing and rejoicing in the things of Christ. And we are built up. And that is why we gather. I gather, and you gather, because the world is a dark place and we need that participation and reminder in Christ as we fellowship together rejoicing in what He has done for us. And so may we do that. May we long to get together. To be sharpened be built up, to be encouraged, to encourage, to serve and to be served, and to be ever thankful for what Christ has done as we together bear witness to his goodness to us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can gather as we do. We thank you that we do gather as we do. I pray, Lord, that you would help us in our times of meeting to draw nearer to you to bless one another with the gifts that you've given us that we would be reminded that the world is not going to like us but jesus did not come to make friends with the world he came to seek and save that which is lost and father may we be about that mission may we be about that witness bearing reality may we be about bearing fruit for the name of christ together Father, please make us a light, a city on a hill. Make us salt in this place that needs it. May we be faithful to our mission and our ministry right here in Thermopolis to those whom you've placed before us. May we be a people of prayer and may we be a people of gospel witness. Help us, Lord, to do this, please, we ask. By the power of your Spirit, help us. In Jesus' name we all pray.
Amen.